Well, I think the thing that was most interesting to me about India is how similar it is to America in ways that other places aren't. I feel like you're like, oh, Japan's cool, Dubai's cool, whatever. But they don't have what I think America has, which is like this drive to be better, this drive to change. Like if you go to these other places, they're very like sanctimonious. Uh, but there's also, I don't know, like it lacks something that I like personally, which is like the conflict and culture I think is made of, which is like a lot of conflict, right? Like a lot of people trying to do stuff. But being in India was that like systemically, it felt like people want, and you can see this in just the GDP per capita, like clearly there's like a hockey stick happening. It's not like a made up, it's not a meme. Today we had Sahil Lavinga on the pod. Sahil is an entrepreneur known as a founder and CEO of Gumroad, an investor, painter, and writer. Through SHL Capital, he invests 10 million a year into early stage technology startups, mostly via 100 to 250K checks. During our conversation, we covered founding story of SHL Capital, portfolio construction, traits of successful founders, his visit to India, biggest takeaways from his time in India, opportunities in India, how can a founder pitch to him, what does he look for when investing in a startup, what's his typical day looks like, who is he outside of work and much more. Now I bring you Sahil. All right, Sahil, so good to finally have you on the podcast. Welcome to uh, the podcast. Thanks for having me. Sahil, there's a lot to unpack, man, uh, especially your, your visit to India. Uh, before that, maybe let's start by, uh, you know, your, your journey into investing. Uh, what was the founding story of SHL Capital? Uh, the founding story of SHL Capital specifically was, so I'd been doing some angel investing before. So in 2011, when I moved to the Bay Area, I, I started writing checks into my friends' startups. Uh, and people I met on AngelList actually, uh, as a way to kind of learn about startups while, you know, before starting my own, I was still an employee at, at Pinterest. And so I had been doing that, uh, semi-successfully. And in 2020, uh, I, after the George Floyd stuff happened in the U S I tweeted, I want to invest in more black founders. Here's my email. And at that point, I had just sort of been building an audience on Twitter, tweeting about building, building Gumroad into what it was, the ups and downs of raising money, all that, all that, all that kind of stuff. And so I had an audience that a lot of VCs maybe didn't have access to, at, at least at this point, right? COVID, a lot of people have built their audiences and things like this. But mm -hmm. uh, in the sort of early days of COVID, uh, I think it was sort of a unique advantage. And, and so I, I got some deals that you know, that way invested in three or four founders, put together memos of these investments, sent them to investors in Gumroad. Uh, at this point, I wasn't really even living in San Francisco. I, I had sort of disconnected from the community, but I still had, you know, investors in, in Gumroad, nine investors from the seed round, including Naval. And so I emailed them and said, hey, I've invested in three or four founders. If you'd like to invest, you know, let me know. I'll intro you, right? That sort of thing that happens in Silicon Valley, right? Uh, it's like a job, it's like a, not a real job, but it's a thing a lot of people do. Uh, anyway, so I was doing that and then Naval replies and says, Hey, you know, you're doing a lot of work, right. In terms of sourcing the companies, vetting the companies, meeting the founders, deciding the check size, all that stuff. Like you're just not, you're, you just don't have the money, right? So you're basically like, you're raising, you're, you're effectively operating like a venture fund, except you just don't have any capital to deploy. Uh, right. So you can, and, and so if you want to do that, actually that like we have this product at AngelList called rolling funds and we can actually help you. We're trying to figure this thing out where we're trying to help people go from zero to one and bridge that gap of people who would be really good at investing, but maybe don't have the way to like actually raise the money in the first place. Right. And so you have imagine like a lot of great founders or, or whatnot who are equity rich cash poor generally requires some amount of cash. And, and also like the people who invest typically in, in venture funds are often not, you know, not in your network, you know, as a, as a founder, you may not have met a lot of people in the finance industry and things like this. So anyway, I, I sort of had a call with Naval and he explained to me the rolling funds product. And, uh, I was like, oh yeah, this is actually great. I have built this audience on Twitter. Uh, they seem to be interested in these sorts of things. I can, you know, reach out to them and, and see if anyone's interested in, in giving me money to do this 
still part-time, like not a full-time job, but at least scale up. And the demand was, I mean, it was pretty shocking. Uh, you know, in hindsight, there was a lot of ZERP sort of mentality behind it, I think. But there was, I think, you know, over the last three or four years, deployed maybe like $40 million or something, mm -hmm. uh, which is a lot for one person to get to choose. Like, these are the founders that deserve yeah. to keep going and have money to to pull off their weird idea, right? Um, so yeah, I'm still doing it. I still have about $5 million. Um, but anyway, that's just the that's the kind of origin story behind SHL Capital. Gotcha, uh, Sahil. And and what's the uh, portfolio construction like for SHL Capital? Uh, you know, how many deals you invest in? What kind of check sizes? Is it globally? Uh, maybe let's uh, dig a bit deeper into that. Sure. Yeah. So I write. I'm, historically, I've been writing 100 to 250k. Uh, I'm trying to go up actually now, so up to 500k probably. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get more involved i think in the companies uh mm -hmm. and now that i've been doing this for a while with this fund i have built up a portfolio of like a bunch of companies and i kind of want to double down on the on the on the things that i think are most interesting to me things that i can be helpful with um i invest globally i do think it's valuable to be more specific though um and so i think you know just generally the places in which i plan to spend more time over the next 10 to 20 30 years which will you know be places like new york san francisco bangalore probably um maybe other other places um but i tend to be pretty mobile so uh i think more than most uh vcs are anyway um and then your other question i guess i mean how many companies do i invest in like i really think about it like i want to I want to, I, I sort of think of it like a FOMO mitigation. So it's, it's less about portfolio construction on a returns basis and more about, am I trying to, am I getting exposure to enough companies in which we get access to like some of the next great, you know, tr trillion dollar companies or whatnot. Right. So I think it's about, it's about almost not having too many rules uh, mm -hmm. and making sure that you're okay investing in like an electric boat company or, a genetics genomics company or a synthetic womb company or uh you know things the things that most people would not invest in right and i think that is the point of i think a vc remains interesting and relevant it's because you know you're basically choosing to invest in things no one else would yeah. rationally invest in you know other every every other process of investing has too many decision makers uh, who are two, and you know, the, the VC is like the one where you can potentially have like a bunch of weird people deploying, you know, a lot of capital relative to their weirdness, you know, mm -hmm. um, or their uh, normalcy, I guess, in that case. But. Got it. And Sahil, are there any examples in your portfolio where, you know, again, like there were just weird investments, uh, almost no one was funding, you came in and they turned out to be very good? Um, I mean, honestly, no, because the truth is since, 2009 or 10, I think it's been cr a crazy time, you know, in terms of people have been want, like the, the, basically the iPhone came out mm -hmm. and at that moment in 2007, maybe it took up until the app store in 2009. Like at that point, everyone was like, holy shit, this is going to be very disruptive. Like this is going to reverberate through the entire world. And I think since there was like maybe two or three years where basically there's like a, it's almost like a liquidity, cr like there's so much demand, but there's no way to get to the, the companies. Y Combinator basically created this thing and funneled a lot of that early demand. Uh, but I remember going to, you know, for example, YC Demo Day in 2011, I believe it was. And you know, it was like 10 or maybe 20, 30 companies, maybe, I think 20, 22 companies or something on stage uh, during the day and about 120 or maybe something like that investors uh and these are the best investors like in the world uh but already i mean if you can imagine like you know each of those investors is already at that point like running a five to ten million you know two to ten million dollar fund there's only 20 companies and this is when at that stage like you know gusto was on state you know like the quality of you know this is like they didn't have 300 companies from around the world, they really, really, really had to be super selective. Yeah. So anyway, even at that point, I felt like, wow, you're competing with, you know, already a hundred people to try to get into the best three or four companies. Uh, and at that, and already the valuations were like 10 to $20 million. 
right? Mm-hmm. Um, and this is 2011, right? I mean, like, it's funny because I, you know, a lot of people, th- I don't, I think the bubble, the way I think about the bubble of, to- of, of COVID and all this stuff is not necessarily that like valuations point up. It's just that it's sort of the future, you know, was not evenly distributed, right? Like if you were in certain places, you had the bubble like environment and the, you know, that kind of just spread to a lot more people, a lot more people had access to $20 million seed rounds versus in 2010, only Stripe had access to a $20 million seed round, right? Through Sequoia. And and so anyway, yeah, I, I, I sort of, you know, I, I think it's sort of been oversaturated for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and so anyway, the point being that I don't think I've ever really invested in something uh, and been the only one. Like it's always been yeah. like a crazy time to invest in Figma or Notion I think the only time in which that would be the case would be if you're building your own idea, right? Because you're so early, you're like, it's literally in your own head and you're like looking at your own idea and you're like, holy shit, this could be really interesting and really big, you know? But the truth is capital is easy. Capital is very fungible. It is very liquid. So as soon as an idea has like some level of merit and a team behind it, I do think that those things actually get funded very fast. Yeah. Um, and I even think about this when hiring people and generally in looking at founders, it's like, I, I'm looking for the people who are on the bunny hill of skiing, right? Where like, there's the bunny hill and you go to a ski resort, there's like 10 mountains, whatever, ranging in difficulty. There's a bunny hill, which is where you kind of learn to ski. And I always like, when I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, I was like, this is a weird, it's, it doesn't match the power law I'm familiar with, which is normally you have like a lot of easy routes and a few you know, very hard routes, right? And there's like this power law of like difficulty or whatever, uh, because most people don't get that far. But actually what I learned is actually in like something like skiing, it's not really about difficulty. It's just about like you spend a week and then you're able to do like the black diamonds or whatever. Yeah. Like it doesn't actually take that much to get to like what looks hard because then it's about speed and like, you know, other things. Uh, so anyway, the the bunny hill exists. There's not that many people on it. Every, but everybody who became amazing spent some amount of time on that bunny hill. And so I'm really trying to like figure out what are the bunny hills that exist in real life and can I just watch them, right? Yeah. And then every once in a while, there's somebody who shows up on the bunny hill that's freaking good. And I'm like, this person's going to be gone tomorrow, right? But if maybe I can hire them or give them some money and get on the cap table. But they're clearly like, but that generally means biasing towards people who like don't have a lot of experience. Uh, there's generally a reason that that founder wouldn't like didn't unlock, you know, yeah. earlier in their life for whatever reason. But often I think, you know, there's a lot of, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes, I think in seeing someone who I think is really good and they've just kind of been growing linearly like this for a long time. Uh, and I find that those people generally don't tend to blow up, uh, mm-hmm. and become super, super, super successful, uh, later on in life, right? Like a lot of people have, you know, ideas around, oh, there are all these people who became late, super successful later on in life or whatever. Yeah. I tend to think that those people had success early. It was just a different kind of success. And then they morphed it into like, they changed industries or they found a new audience, something like that. But generally they had some like thing early in their life that they're, because, you know, at the end of the day, like if you're living in modernity, you have some level of free time access to the internet now. Mm-hmm. ability to Google and ask chat GPT stuff or whatever. Right. So you should have like the inclinations that would unlock certain things spinning in your head. I don't think that happens when you're 50. Like, I don't think it takes $5 million in your bank account. Right. I think it yeah. takes a curious mind and that happens when you're 12. Right. Or whatever. Got it. And uh, Sahil, you know, uh, you were angel investing and now, of course, you've been investing through the fund. Uh, along the way, are there one or two people that, that have, or investors in particular who have really helped you uh, become a better investor? Um, I mean, I think the the investors in Gumroad are probably like the most useful to me, honestly, because they I can sort of just see how they think about their Gumroad investment and how like the, just the advice that they've given me as a founder, like, I, I, I don't know how helpful advice is from like an investor giving advice to another investor. Uh, I just find that it's, it's, it's sort of like every investor is a little too competitive with every other investor. So it's very hard to get real alpha out of somebody, right? Because inherently, 
if there's an advantage, I'll, I'll take advantage of it. And then I will tell you, right. Um, like I'm not going to play poker with an open hand mm-hmm. because there's, there's just kind of a commodity. Right. Um, but I might play a sport like tennis with an open, I might tell you what I'm going to do next because I just have a advantage over you that doesn't go away with transparency. Right. Um, so anyway, uh, I think the f- investor to founder advice to me is, is, has been much more helpful because it's sort of, I am not competitive. You know, every founder is kind of competitive with very few people that are trying to, you know, solve the same problem with the same set of customers or, or whatnot. Um, and also I find that they, the advice they give, like the more specific the advice, the better it is. And I think investors tend to give very generalized advice, which I don't think is like, for example, it's like something I tell a lot, to be honest, is I like focus on cash flow. Right. And it's like, okay, <laughs> like, no shit. Like I would like to make more money and spend less money. Right. Like, but if you, if you're running a business and you're talking to another founder, you know, you, you, the question would be more like, like of the hundred people, a hundred, you know, let's say you've hired a hundred people in the last year, like how many of those people would you hire knowing how good they are now? Mm-hmm. You know, like if you fired everyone and then had to rehire every single person, uh, and also who would you put at the, you, you have to order them, right? Who are you hiring one at yeah. back at a time? And that is, you know, that to me is, is hard, right? And this is, I think, going back to Angelus, what I think is so awesome about Angelus is it sort of almost gets rid of the investor persona and it sort of says, hey, actually, it's sort of we the people, right? Like the founders who built the companies and built the wealth doing that and the people who participate in that, including all the employees can now invest in people. And if that's really an efficient market, you may not need as many professional quote unquote investors. Um, but anyway, yeah, I would say like Max Levchin, Josh Koppelman, Naval, uh, Seth Goldstein, Samil Shah, like a bunch of people on the Gumroad cap table have been pretty helpful just in giving me feedback, you know, just in being honest with me about, Hey, this is what you running the business looks like to me, you know, uh, like you said this, which sounds funny on Twitter, but like as an investor in your company, I might think this, right. And like, that is uh, very, very useful, especially in a world I think of remote and more async sort of mm-hmm. like it's hard to give people heart like feedback sometimes uh, or all the time it triggers your fight or flight sort of anxiety uh and so i find being able to do that in person like the whole role of like being able to grab a beer with someone after work right like the function that that serves is you can like you both have a beer and then like 40 minutes in you can say hey by the way like this thing that you do is kind of annoying you know uh very few people would be comfortable at like 4 p.m sober being like, Hey, this, you're being annoying. This kind of annoying, you know, um, that's what makes you like some people able to be CEOs of companies, right. Is they're the ones who are able, you know, to do that, you know, yeah. um, like Elon would be like, I'm fucking taking a nap dude. please go away. Like, you know, um, most people don't have that, uh, disagreeableness. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the other thing, honestly, just to, add, to like talk my own book for a second. I really am excited about crowdfunding in this way because I think it opens the door to getting way more feedback, right? From way more uh, interested parties, right? Like imagine if you have, like imagine like the amount of feedback that Zuck gets because he literally has like probably at this point, tens of millions of shareholders, right? If not hundreds of millions of shareholders um, must be pretty awesome, right? Like must be pretty great to be able to wake up every day and be like, oh, cool. I don't have to do analysis on my own business, Mm -hmm. you know, like, or at least I can start my day with 10,000 other people's analysis on my business. And some of them are really smart and really well paid. Some of them are short, some of them are long. Uh, like, but imagine like all of that free analysis that you get, right? It's like, it must be pretty freaking awesome. I get a little bit of that, you know, probably 0.01% of that. But if I could have 100 times the amount of investors, I think it would be pretty, pretty awesome. And that's what I'm trying to do is basically figure out how do I get the cap table of Gumroad into the people who, you know, to the people who are going to be the most value additive and the, you know, contribute the best ideas and, and work. Gotcha. And Sahil, you know, uh, you had great success. You've backed companies like, uh, you know, Figma, Mercury, uh, Versil, and few others. Uh, have you seen a pattern across those successful investments? Uh, is, did you, were you able to? There are, I mean, there's so many patterns, like the founders have two eyes, you know, uh, like there's a lot of patterns, but I don't know if there's any pattern that is actually going to, you know, be that insightful. Um, I would say like the, the, all, all the patterns are basically all the things that like, you don't want to hear basically, right? Like the, 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 
the sort of Naval Navalism about if something comforts you, look for the lie in it, and if something hurts you, look for the truth in it. Uh, and I I think that a lot of the it's like for example like definitely like young right like the young founders generally tend to be more successful at least on this sort of VC return profile that you're looking for. Uh, and I think that's largely to do with that bunny hill thing, right? Which is like, if you're really good, you just have that kind of success will happen to you earlier, uh, in an efficient sort of liquid market. And, uh, and you know, if you're 50, then you probably have some reason that you're like on an Island, you know, for a while or something. Right. Um, so I, I would say that's the most use and maybe then the meta advice is like those people are okay with really hard, like hearing really hard feedback, right? Like they're willing to, they want their business to work and they don't really care that much about themselves. They just want their business to be successful, right? They don't have that much of an ego about how the business works, like what it looks like, what the name of the, of the product is. Um, I'd say honestly, in this way, I'm not that even that good of a founder because I think I'm probably too stubborn on like the direction Gumroad should go in. I'm not good enough at mm -hmm. this sort of maniacal focus around just being successful. Um, the other thing is they're just generally very technical. Like they're very, uh, and they're technical outside of, I think the pursuit of making more money. I think they just tend to be technical people. And then the m making money aspect appears to them as like a way to basically get more free time to be spend more time learning about more stuff. Um, so I think that, you know, that generally that I think like people like, you know, Guillermo from Bruxelles or Ahmad from Mercury or Dylan from Figma, like they, they all track to this kind of pattern where they all started pretty young. They were sort of building and experimenting with technology, trying to figure stuff out, but also trying to make some money, uh, you know, did probably do some traditional stuff. Cause I think this is the other thing I think a lot of people think, oh, like the ideal profile is like a college dropout or like. 16 year old, like they sort of take it too far. Right. And it's like, no, actually like you need some experience, right? Like you need some proof of work, a few thousand hours learning Python and Ruby and CSS and HTML and building stuff and learning economics and math and physics. Like you can't really skip and that. And that stuff takes time. Like you're, like, I don't think there'll ever be a seven year old billionaire, <laughs> right? Like, I just think that sort of biologically, there's certain constraints on seven-year-olds that will probably prevent them from being self-made billionaires. Um, you know, things like puberty have to happen first, right? Uh, so, but, you know, figuring out, okay, this is the kind of place I need to be in at maybe 25 or something like that, um, 20 to 25. And, you know, this is like the story that these people have. And like, like, I remember thinking this as a kid where I was like, shit, if I don't learn to code, I'm screwed. Like, I really need to learn. Uh, it wasn't like intuitive for me. It's not like I woke up one day and like, was like, oh yeah, I'm excited to learn Python. It just really was a nagging feeling of like, holy shit, if I don't figure this out, I will, you know, like my prospects in life will, will not be great, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, it's the same thing that drives certain people to move from India to America, right? It's just like this idea like, oh shit, if I don't fix this, I'm going to have a subpar life, right? Or whatever. And so- yeah. I think it's a similar sort of feeling and it's just like you take it into your own hands and you say, okay, like the, you, whatever excuses you have are completely valid, right? It just doesn't matter. And like life doesn't really care. Uh, you know, all the excuses everyone has eventually just cancels out and everyone's on their own. So. Yeah. Moving to India, Sahil, uh, you know, you have a community going on around Indian founders. You launched an app where one can learn Hindi. A lot is going on. And so what was your reason of visiting India and how was the trip like? Yeah, I mean, the first reason, uh, the primary reason is to visit my nani, my grandmother in Bombay. So she's lived there uh, for a long time now, I guess, 15, 20 years. Um, and, she, you know, she'd hop around with like the her children in Oman and Singapore and then eventually came, went back to India. So I, the last time I visited was 2016. Uh, and yeah, I just felt like, wow, like it seems like a lot has happened. But it's only it seems, right? Because at the end of the day, all I'm doing is reading stuff on the internet, right? That like people say about India. Uh, and it's a tiny, 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 tiny little, like looking through a little like keyhole, I think, right? At the country. And 
also i'd never really been anywhere outside of bombay like when i went to india i would just i mean i went to go once or whatever but like mostly you know was in this one part like of bombay even um which aligns with like slumdog millionaire so it's like very much like that was like sort of my view and so i was like okay i'm going to be visiting her i might as well like there's all these people from twitter like i should at least spend like you know i should go to delhi i should go to i want to go see the taj mahal so i'll go see that i'll go go to bangalore uh and just get a sense of you know like not really have an agenda just like spend two or three like my mom's like what do you want to do in each city i'm like i don't like three days will go by very fast you know like just like unpacking and packing or whatever uh you know checking out like the the park checking out the number one tourist attraction whatever that is like that you know checking out the number one and two restaurant like your day will go by very fast, right? When you're on holiday. Uh, and so anyway, I did that. And then I just said, I'm also going to just do a meetup in every city. I'll just create a telegram group inspired by Peter Levels and just say, hey, I'm going to be at this place, you know, at this time in each city and just see what, like, see who shows up. Uh, and there's a lot of people. Yeah. Turns out there's 1.4 or 5 billion people in India and a couple of them followed me on Twitter. Uh, and it was cool. It was fun to meet all the, all the crazy people. I think the thing that was most of interesting to me about India is how similar it is to America in ways that other places aren't, you know, like there are other places where I feel like you're like, oh, Japan's cool. Italy's cool. You know, London's cool. Uh, Singapore's cool. Dubai's cool, whatever. But they don't have what I think America has, which is like this drive to be better, this drive to change. Like if you go to these other places, they're very like sanctimonious. They're very like, this is, and it's like, everyone's kind of middle-class. Everyone has like a decent life. Um, you know, there's not a lot of like, you know, class division or whatever racial strife or protests or, or homelessness or whatever in these places. Uh, but there's also, I don't know, like it lacks something that I like personally, which is like the conflict and like the, the stuff that culture I think is made of, which is like a lot of conflict, right? Like a lot of people trying to do stuff like build buildings or shoot movies or whatever. And they're trying to do that stuff because like, I don't know, they're driven by greed or they're driven by love or they're driven by who knows what. Um, but I find that there's very, very few places truly that are like trying to be better on a systemic level. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and America's like that for sure. Uh, I would say maybe El Salvador and Argentina are maybe going through that. Maybe all of America is going through this. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but it feels like, yes, yeah, most places are just kind of complacent. And what I loved about being in India was that like systemically it felt like people want, and you can see this in just the GDP per capita, like clearly there's like a hockey stick happening. It's not like a made up, it's not a meme, right? Like it's, it's like, no, in the last 10 years, everyone got a phone and access to the internet and UPI and like GSTs and, you know, high speed rail like that. Not, and none of this is like startups, right? Like, I think that's the other thing that I try, like, I have an audience in startups. I built like a software company, but at the end of the day, like just pro it's about providing value to the people around you. Right. And like Elon is like the number one startup guy, but he doesn't really build software. Um, and so I think that like, that's another thing is like, you know, I think people, I, I do worry that my audience, like, you know, you tend to get too, too focused on like, Oh, it has to be an AI powered community building app, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, oh, it could just be like a really good coffee shop, you know, that that's necessary too. And, in, 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 you know, for, for, for society to grow, for you to pay your bills, for you to feel like you've had an impact, all that stuff. I think mm -hmm. both, both should, should qualify. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, talking about GDP uh, per capita, Sahil, you know, it took about, uh, for India, it took 60 years to reach, you know, 1 trillion in GDP. Uh, the second trillion, uh, it took 12 years. Third trillion was six years. Now they're saying India will be producing one trillion every, uh, you know, 16 to 20 months uh, for the next you know, 20, 30 years. So that's the scale uh, that we'll be going through. And Sahil, you recently tweeted saying, you know, if you want to be a billionaire, move to India. Uh, where, where did that come from? What's that? Yeah, well, that was the first thought of that was I saw on Instagram, someone had come to a meetup and said, like, I met a billionaire or something like that. Uh, and I was like, that does no, I was going to respond and say, I'm not a billionaire. And then I realized what they were doing in their head was basically they're speaking in rupiah. They're just, you know, doing the conversion rate. And they're like, oh, this guy's probably worth 10 million US dollars or something. Right. Uh, 
again, a couple of people did it. So I kind of noticed that pattern and I was like, oh, people don't think I'm a billionaire. They just think I'm rich, like a millionaire. What you'd say is a millionaire in the US, right? Basically. Uh, and and I, I just thought that was funny. Like, I was like, oh, that's kind of a funny th thing that like, you know, because in the US and I even wrote an article about this, there's like this obsession uh, of becoming a billionaire, right? Becoming like really rich. And what's funny about what I what I think is kind of humor humorful about what startups have done is that they've raised the bar to being a billionaire, right? It used to be like when you were a kid, like, oh, I want to be a millionaire when I grow up. And that, then it became because of Bill Gates and Zuck and all these people like, oh, I want to be a billionaire. And I think people forget like the, how much money, like how hard that is, right? Like that's a thousand millions, right? Like that's a lot. Uh, like imagine building one house versus building a thousand houses, right? Like it's very different scale. Uh, but anyway, I just thought it was a funny thing that like, it's this goal that people have in the US that they strive their whole life to say, oh, I want to try to become a billionaire or whatever. Uh, it's so much easier, quote unquote, to do in India just because the bar is 80 times less, right? Uh, so that was like the joke. But then also I think just the, the GDP growth, right? Like if you're willing to value yourself in rupees, because I think the biggest sort of a, a steel man to this argument would be that the conversion rate is tough, right? And so if your economy doubles, but your currency halves, you've like, it's way easier to, to half a currency, yeah. right? Like that, that happened in Nigeria in the last two years versus to double your economy, like doubling your economy is like this massive thing. And so the U S has this pretty unfair advantage, right? Which, is, which, is, which is why I think the smart, I don't know, this is my bias, but this, the, the, what I would love to see is the sort of American, uh, countries. Uh, that are kind of like, I would like to believe El Salvador, Argentina, uh, India, you know, and like almost like this new kind of uh, thing is all focused on working together and growing uh, together. Um, and the U.S. is obviously like, you know, massive market uh, for goods. I think our number one supplier is Mexico right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, not China anymore. Uh, so there's a lot, but you know, that like a lot, I think software will often be provided by the U S to Indians, uh, you know, to India and like India will be good at other things. Uh, software will play a component, obviously there's like massive software too. Uh, but like, I don't think for example, like India is going to launch a Facebook competitor and win, mm -hmm. right? Like that, that probably won't happen. But if you think about, oh, wow, high-speed rail is going to connect Ahmedabad and Mumbai, and that is going to be ridiculously like that whole region will go from looking, you know, like Oman to looking like Dubai, you know, like that's what will happen when you have like that level of throughput. Um, and uh, like, I don't, th and that, that's the other thing. Like, I think people, they, they think they have to be really smart and they're like, oh, that's not, sm that's not enough of an insight to become a billionaire in India. Right. Mm -hmm. But that actually is <laughs> like that literally just knowing that yeah. and being like, oh, wow. Yeah. Like network effects, the Shinkansen, you know, like you could, you, it's not that crazy to say, yeah, if you just start any business, like the most successful people I met in, in India were people who just owned stores. That's it. Like, they're just like, oh yeah, I own a few Samsung stores or I own a few, you know, this, this store, or that store. Right. Um, because that, that's like the same is they're, they're owning equity in a dividend producing business, right? They're, they're, they're creating, they're, they're, and they're taking advantage, like Bangalore is growing nine and a half percent GDP per capita or GDP per year. But how do you take advantage of that? If you're just sitting there eating Pani Puri, you don't get, you're only seeing that in the price of the Pani Puri going up, right? Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to be selling the Pani Puri. You have to be a producer in the economy in some capacity, right? Um, and I found that most successful people are the ones who are like, oh yeah, like there's a high speed rail going here. There should probably, you know, there'll be a new rail stop here. Like there'll be a whole new res set of resort towns all up and down the coast that by the way, are probably already resort towns. It's not like you have to go find new ones, right? It's like, no, the ones that are already the biggest ones, they're just going to, they're just tiny compared to where they're going to be in 20 years. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, you know, if you're passionate about surf, like start a surf school, you know, like it's, you don't have to be that creative and, you know, if you are successful with that, you can like start a hotel and then a resort and then this is how you know, most ho hotel chains started basically. Um, just someone who started a, a small business, right? And to serve the needs of like the local community at that point in time. Um, so anyway, uh, 
I'm very excited about India. I mean, I think that like America is like, you, obviously, you know, has a lot of advantages. You have people with a lot of money, so you can sort of sell products and services more easily. Uh, but honestly, like the quality of life in America is so good already that it's hard. It's really hard to, it's like humbling, honestly, to try to compete in this market because like you want to launch a coffee shop here, like there's 5,000 of them, you know, you can be successful. I'm not saying you can't be successful. Certainly you can. Uh, but you know, it is, it is really hard. Uh, and the wins are not as obvious in terms of like what's coming next. And there's so much capital supply that you're competing with you know, people with tons of capital behind them all the time. And it creates this like pr prisoner's dilemma sort of thing versus I feel like in India, my hope would be that it's more like we're, you know, pre Y Combinator or something, right. Where there's obviously like a lot of cultural export from the U S and things like that. But in terms of the buyer's market for it, you're not going to have like the 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 drop boxes of India for a long time because you're not going to have people paying like three dollars a month for like storage, right? Like that that, that part of the of the supply demand chain may not exist or something. Um, but if you can figure out oh how do I take all these smart engineers and you know make make this train part more efficiently or make this thing that we currently pay China for or Japan for, mm -hmm. um, we should just make here. You know, um, like I, I was walking around one of the like one of the things I noticed is how in New York, where I live now, uh, most of the marble is from Europe or America, but not a lot of the marble is from India. But the most famous marble structure in the world is the Taj Mahal. So, in you know, like I think like there's probably a large opportunity to figure out how do you sell. And I'm sure, you know, one of the things I love about business is you find out all the reasons like historically, this has not happened yet, right? Because the answer is, is basically like there's some political reason or regulatory reason or tariff or, you know, like, like some, there's some reason. Like it's not like this is a, a novel insight. Oh, yeah, you should just sell marble from India to mm -hmm. the U.S. or something. Uh, but there's probably a bunch of things you have to go action. And that's what the entrepreneur does. Like the entrepreneur has to go figure out there's we should be selling up like a hundred million dollars a year of marble from this one town in India, which would 500 X the GDP of this town. Like there's literally a freaking mountain right there, you know, and people are, you know, and it's like free. You can just take it if you want it. And then in, in, in New York, people are paying like a hundred dollars a pound for like thin pieces of it. So like, why don't we just make thin pieces out of this stuff and, you know, put this stuff on Alibaba or whatever. Right. Um, and anyway, so I, 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 that's what I was excited. I just, I just saw like the, and that, go, that was basically what inspired the tweet is I just like, wow, if I really was just trying to become a billionaire in rupees, uh, you know, and, and, and the other thing is it was about moving to India. So I think that's the other thing that I think I tried to hint at is it's hard to do this from within because you're like, you're kind of, you don't know the water you swim in sometimes, but if you spend some time out and then come back, I think you have an advantage because you're able to say, oh, I learned all these other things in this new place. And I came back and realized like, oh, the way India does this is like actually really bad or really good. Um, and also potentially as a way to get some capital leverage so that, you know, you know, 100,000 US will go way farther in starting your business idea in Bangalore, you know, than 100,000 rupees, right? So if you can get that access to capital, if you go to school in Australia or something like that, I do think that that gives you an advantage. Um, yeah, but that's, I know that was like a long winded answer to like, yeah, one yeah one. no, uh, uh, totally. Those eight words that went into it. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally with you on that. Uh, <clears throat> Sahil, in fact, I had, uh, you know, uh, uh, his name is Arjun. He founded a company called, uh, uh, ah, I'm, I'm forgetting the name, uh, forgot, but anyway, uh, you know, he came back and he built a company, uh, sold it for $600 million. Uh, and I asked him, like, you know, what advice would you give to folks, you know, who are abroad and you know, looking to move back to India? And he said, uh, man, you know, a country which is you know, emerging uh, typically has billions of problems. And that translates into billions of uh, you know, opportunities, uh, given how the country is growing. And if you can come back and, you know, uh, stick to something where you're good at uh, and have a long-term view, uh, you can really, really build uh, something massive and uh, impactful. And, uh, and on, on the other side, you know, as you said, like, you know, there's advantage where you move to US or any other country and come back, 
uh, you you know uh, you can spot an opportunity, and that's what you know I've noticed that out of all the unicorns, uh, you know more than forty percent are actually built by a reverse brain drain, meaning you know people moving back to India and building companies. And Sahil, uh, you know you are excited about India, maybe, uh, and it seems like uh, you know you are looking to invest. Uh, in in companies uh, you know, from India, like I'm a founder uh, looking to you know reach out to Sahil and kind of get a sense: Would I be even fit uh, to Sahil? Uh, what would that scenario look like? Yeah, I mean, it's it's you know one anyone should feel free to shoot me a note either on Twitter or email me sahil.living@gmail.com. But basically, just say, hey, I this is a problem. This is how I discovered the problem. This is why no one has solved the problem. This is my proposed solution to the problem. Either it's like built, it's a URL I can check out, or it's, you know, it requires something more than that. And you've, but like, I, I want, like, I kind of want like a thought process, right? I want, like, I want, like, I want to learn is kind of how I would think about it. Like teach me something about the world and like do a thousand hours of research and give it to me in five minutes, right? Like if, if you can show me like, oh, wow, you've really thought through, uh, you know, like the equivalent, let's say you're writing a, like a, a fiction novel, I would just say, send me the first five pages, right? Even if you've written the whole thing, if you've gone through the process of writing all of that stuff, the first five pages will be really good because it's going to foreshadow and hint at all the things because you've taken all of that and put it into the first five pages, right? So similarly, I would say just like, you know, a really like I would think about it like a one page or just in the email of, you know, just like the best like educational resource about the problem that you're trying to solve and why the next 10 years are the right decade to solve it. And, you know, with this particular technology, this particular time and place or, or whatnot, um, you know, like, for example, I think the best example of this is probably like the Elon Musk Tesla master plan. I read that and I was like, let's invest in Tesla. That's obvious. Like just like it was such clear thinking on like, oh yeah, this makes sense on how you would actually get EVs to market, right? Like for example, I would be very interested. I would totally invest in someone who said, hey, I want to do EVs like in India. I think the biggest problem probably in India, not the biggest maybe, but one of them is just pollution, right? It's just not a new thing. Uh, but eventually the problem is solved by, uh, in my opinion, by underground public transport and electric vehicles like those two are the are like the will do more than anything else uh and that's what new york you know new york used to have way more traffic than it does now they just built a shitload of public transport added a lot of congestion fees still adding more singapore just etc uh you know it's not it's rome paris tokyo new york london so like eventually there'll be underground rail in india right it's just going to take another however long um so anyway, if someone was like, hey, I know I, I have a, a thought on how to do that for this market. And this is why it's similar to the U.S. market. And this is why it's going to be different because it's it's like the same man never walks through the same river twice sort of thing. Uh, but it had like, you know, three or four or five paragraphs, really cogent, like and I was like, oh, wow, I, I got a lot smarter. Like, oh, wow, I was really stupid before. <laughs> I was really not thinking it straight oh like you know india can't have underground because of this these five reasons and the climate and this and whatever you know um but that is kind of what i'm looking for you know like why isn't every rickshaw ev um uh, like there's so much sun here i imagine you could solar power them they seem you know like are how close are we to that um you know uh I'm, you know that that's that's how i would how how i would sort of think about it um Got it. And, uh, and Sahil writes, uh, again, uh, 100 to uh, 250K checks. And, uh, and Sahil, with this, uh, you know, we'll move into our, our last section. Uh, my co-pilot, uh, Alfonso, in the back, he wants to come in. And, uh, and he's asking, what's been uh, making you smile uh, lately, Sahil? What's been making me smile lately? Um, what's been making me smile lately? Um, hmm, that's a hard, uh, hard question to answer. I don't know. I feel like I'm a pretty uh, monotonic person, to be honest. Uh, my like most emotional happy state is not too different from my most emotional sad state. Uh, though I, I, I eventually I get there. Um, I, I would say like just spending time with like old friends, uh, and, uh, you know, like hanging out with my nanny for the first time in like six years, like 
doing stuff like that and being like, oh, this is really easy. It's not hard to to just spend time with people. So it makes me smile that like there'll be a lot more of that happening in the next 70 years. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And, and what's a typical day like? You run a very uh, fascinating uh, company, you know, and of course, uh, people know about it. There are no employees. It's just, uh, just a different way of building something. But what's your typical day like? Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not too different than the average, uh, you know, retired golf player or whatever. You know, I uh, get up, I do email. I get up earlier than I really want to. I just tend to wake up at like 4 or 5 a.m. And then I do email and work stuff. Uh, and then I generally am done with that by 6 a.m. or something like that. And then I wait for like the bagel shop to open, go get a coffee and a bagel, go to the gym, uh, have a few Zoom meetings throughout the day. Uh, and then just think about, just think, you know, just like think and read and like just decide like, okay, what do I, like a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, life, I think once you have like the things that you want, it's just kind of like, there's not a lot of micro, you just have to do the things, you know, you just have to go to the gym. You just have to go, you know, like you just have to do the, it's not hard. Uh, Like I don't have to sort of spend a ton of time thinking, oh, how do I make Gumroad more successful? Because the machine is doing that. Like the machine of Gumroad and the employees and the team and the equity split and like all this stuff is, I built in, in, you know, had to do that at one point. So a lot of the, a lot of the time is spent thinking like, should I do something else basically, right? Uh, you just spend, uh, eight hours a day thinking like, should I be doing something else? Which is kind of ironic because it's, it's kind of funny at least because you're kind of like the, the, the thinking of doing something else is the doing something else, right? Like that is actually what I choose to do with my time is I just choose to think about random ass stuff, right? Like moving to India, right? Like, why do I think about that? Well, it's, it's honestly largely because I'm bored and I have literally like a hundred hours a week to think. And so I, this problem of like, should I move to India is not gonna, is gonna take me like a thousand hours, you know? Like it's gonna take me, I have to read like 10 to 20 books. I have to read them, I have to learn a bunch of stuff. I have to invest in people. I have to meet, like, it's a project that will take, you know, like if I move to India, it will take 30 years. Like it's not gonna happen anytime soon, right? Um, so, but I have to start thinking of it and building up to it. Just like if you're trying to build a trillion dollar company, you have to start planning like you have to be like, oh shit, I got to learn how to code. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you might not plan on building a billion dollar company for a long time, but you know, at some point you might want to, and that's going to require a certain set of skills or sort of knowing people or going to college or whatever, you know, having a green mm-hmm. card or something like that. Um, so I'd say that's a lot of what I do is I just think about like, what do I, like, what does my life look like when I'm 70, 80 years old? And how do I make sure that, you know, I'm optimizing for that, but also making sure I'm not waste. I'm not like spending all of my time optimizing for when I'm 70 because I could get hit by a bus tomorrow and then what's the yeah. point. So it's the balance of like present versus future. Uh, but yeah, I generally, I feel like I'm pretty content. I just, I'm, and I just really enjoy thinking about stuff. Uh, but people, t- you know, some people tell me I should just start taking antidepressants or something like that. Uh, a hack that you can't live without. Do you have any of those hacks? A hack that I can't live without. Um, I don't, I mean, I I don't know if there are any hacks. Um, I would say like use the medical, like use the healthcare system, like to constantly upgrade yourself in small ways, like get braces, like just do the small things that will make you feel good about having some disposable income. I got laser surgery, LASIK. Uh, I just think that people underrate those things actually like they like those things compound into like identity changes and like it, you know like take ozempic and like lose 30 pounds or whatever right like that will lead i personally think that it leads to other uh other stuff changing down the line like i know when i'm fit and healthy i feel like going to the gym more like mm-hmm. I just feel like that. And when I'm not, I just don't feel like, you know, just the related uh, physical and emotional states. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I think don't, you know, that would be my life hack is like, you you know, like hack your, use these hacks, but like generally try to find the ones that like just are step function increases, right? Like you don't have to keep, like, I don't like the hacks where it's like every day you have to cold plug. Every day is not a hack to me, right? That's a rule. That's like a system. That's a ritual. 
to me, a hack is you only literally have to do it once and you never have to do it again. And so like things like LASIK, things like, you know, all the fancy new medical stuff that people do all the time, uh, le- le- like yeah, spending time. I-, I would say like even reading Twitter is a hack, to be honest. Like I think the amount of people who've turned off Twitter uh, that now actually like using Twitter is actually an advantage. Um, but using it, like I constantly follow and unfollow people. Like I use it like a newspaper where I'm constantly trying to like refine my front page. And that means it's always changing. Um, and that's a hack. Like I use it. I don't use it socially. I don't use it politically. I don't use it because I'm trying to make friends with certain people. I'm just using it to learn. Um, and I find that that's like a very productive for me personally, like not treating it like a friend group or like a community or, uh, you know, uh, just as a, a tool, um, and a utility, I think can be like, like my phone is not my social network, right? My social network is in real life. Um, and my, at least that, that, that's what I think, I don't know, is a good framing for where I'm at in life. Probably not for everybody. But anyway, I'm going on a rant too much, so I'll stop talking. <laughs> Gotcha, uh, Sahil. Man, uh, thank you so much uh, for coming on the pod and really, you know, walking us through your journey uh, as an investor, now running a fund, uh, and also, you know, uh, uh, giving us a sense of, you know, your trip to India, your excitement around India. And you should totally, uh, you know, spend more time here, uh, you know, maybe. Uh, just come stay for a month or two, see how you like it. Uh, we'll go back. Uh, but uh, yeah, very exciting I'll times. Month. I'll do another month or two in uh, 2025. And yeah, try yeah, I it. think it could be this time. Maybe it could be a little longer trip for you. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, looking forward to meeting you in person also uh, at some point. Awesome. Sounds good. See you in Gurgaon. <laughs>